Daniel Arakia and Eugene Nita's interpretation of Galatians 6.11 offers a nuanced examination of the Apostle Paul's writing style and its significance in this particular verse. They accentuate the lack of consensus among scholars regarding the division of authorship between Paul and a scribe in his letter to the Galatians. While some scholars believe Paul wrote the entire letter, Arakia and Nita posit that Paul likely used a scribe for most of the letter, resuming personal writing only in this section. This practice is supported by similar patterns observed in other Pauline epistles, such as Romans 16.22, 2 Thessalonians 3.17, 1 Corinthians 16.21, and Colossians 4.18. The act of Paul writing portions of the letter himself is seen as a method of authenticating the document, ensuring the recipients recognize the letter as genuinely from him. Also, the discussion delves into the purpose and interpretation of Paul's use of large letters. One theory suggests that the large handwriting serves as a form of emphasis, similar to modern practices of italicizing or affirming text. This would indicate that Paul is asserting the importance of the points he is about to make. Alternatively, it could be an effort by Paul to distinguish his handwriting from that of his scribe, or it might reflect a simple difference in the quality of handwriting, with Paul's being less polished. However, this last explanation is considered less probable since the term big refers merely to the size of the letters, without connotations of irregularity or unattractiveness. Moreover, Arakia and Nita touch upon the translation challenges posed by this verse. They suggest that translating Paul's directive as see what big letters to something like you can see what big letters I make might be more effective in conveying the intended message to readers who were not present with Paul. This adjustment in translation aims to bridge the historical and cultural gap, making the text more relatable and understandable to contemporary audiences. Their analysis highlights the significance of translation choices in accurately conveying the nuances of biblical texts. Furthermore, Arakia and Nita dive into the Apostle Paul's vehement criticism of false teachers in the early Christian community, particularly concerning the issue of circumcision. They unpack the nuances of Paul's language, indicating the deeper implications of his words in the context of Christian faith and Jewish customs. Paul's description of these teachers as individuals who boast about external matters, primarily circumcision, is central to their interpretation. The verb to show off and boast, unique to this passage in the New Testament, is dissected by Arachia and Nida to maintain the teacher's desire for social approval and acceptance, which they seek through adherence to external religious rites. This, according to Paul, contradicts the core Christian principle of faith over outward rituals. The authors clarify that the term flesh in this context is metaphorical, relating more to external religious practices than to the physical body itself. Arakia and Nita then explore the underlying motives of these teachers. Their advocacy for circumcision, they argue, is a strategic move to avoid persecution for embracing the radical implications of the cross of Christ. The cross, as used by Paul, represents not just the physical death of Christ, but its profound spiritual significance, chiefly the establishment of a relationship with God rooted in faith rather than in ceremonial acts like circumcision. These false teachers, the authors suggest, deliberately distort the Christian message to maintain good standing within the Jewish community, thus sidestepping potential persecution. The authors caution against a literal interpretation of persecuted for the cross of Christ. They propose that this could be misconstrued as persecution for the physical cross, rather than for preaching the significance of Christ's death upon it. To avoid confusion, they recommend rephrasing to explicitly connect the avoidance of persecution with a reluctance to preach about the import of Christ's crucifixion. Overall, Arakia and Nita's interpretation of Galatians 6.12 sheds light on Paul's critique of those who prioritize outward religious practices over the essence of Christian faith, and how this stance compromises the transformative message of Christ's death and resurrection. In addition, Arakia and Nita dig into the complexities surrounding the identity of the group practicing circumcision, as mentioned by Paul. They present three predominant perspectives in scholarly circles. The first suggests a general reference to all individuals who accept the validity of circumcision, encompassing a broad demographic that includes people in Galatia and elsewhere. This interpretation posits that Paul's critique is not limited to a specific group, but extends to anyone endorsing the practice. The second perspective narrows the focus to the Galatian Gentile Christians who have undergone circumcision due to the influence of false teachers. This view interprets Paul's words as a direct address to the Galatians, pointing out the localized impact of these false teachings. 
The third viewpoint shifts the spotlight onto the false teachers themselves, suggesting that Paul is directly criticizing those who advocate for circumcision. Further, Erechia and Nita reiterates the deliberate ambiguity in translations, as seen in works like Knox's and J.B.'s. This uncertainty aids in understanding the rest of the verse and allows for a broader interpretation of Paul's message. The scholars repeat that Paul's critique revolves not around the group's inability to follow the law, but their indifference towards it. This is underlined by a touch of sarcasm in Paul's tone, underscoring the hypocrisy of those advocating for the law's observance while failing to adhere to it themselves. Besides, Erechia and Nita explore the motives behind advocating circumcision. The proponents, presumably including the false teachers, sought to boast about their success in converting the Gentiles to Jewish customs, specifically through the physical act of circumcision. The term flesh in this context is intrinsically linked to the rite of circumcision, emphasizing the physical and symbolic significance of the act. The phrase, you submitted to this physical ceremony, is interpreted as the Galatians succumbing to the pressure or persuasion of these influencers, an act that was likely boasted about as a triumph in integrating Gentiles into the Jewish community. Additionally, Arachia and Nita examine the nuances of Paul's declaration of his singular boast in the cross of Christ. This stands in stark contrast to the boasts of false teachers focused on external religious observances like circumcision. The Apostle Paul uses a formulaic expression to vigorously deny any ground for boasting other than the cross of Christ. This expression, previously used in Galatians 2.17 and 3.21, accentuates his complete rejection of the external metrics valued by his opponents. Different translations of this verse affirm varying interpretations. For example, the New English Bible, NEB, and the New American Bible, NAB, maintain the negative form of Paul's statement, asserting what he rejects. In contrast, the today's English version, TEV, presents a positive construction, focusing on what Paul embraces. A significant aspect of their analysis concerns the term boast. In Galatians 6.13, the word carries a pejorative sense, while in 6.14, it is used positively to express legitimate confidence. This difference necessitates distinct translations in verse 14, suggesting alternatives like, I will state my full confidence in, or, I will express my full reliance on to capture the shift in meaning. The cross in this context is not merely a physical object but a symbol of the event of Christ's crucifixion. This event signifies a radical shift in values for Paul, a move away from external measures of worth to a focus on divine acceptance through faith. This shift is encapsulated in the phrase, the world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. The term world here likely refers to a lifestyle valuing external circumstances over a relationship with God, similar to flesh in verse 12. For Paul, the cross signifies the end of valuing worldly measures. Translating this concept might require specifying what aspects of the world have become dead to Paul, or using figurative language to convey the metaphorical death he speaks of. This profound theological shift highlights the transformative power of the crucifixion indicating a value system based not on external observances, but on faith and divine relation. Also, Arakia and Nita offer a profound theological insight into the nature of Christian identity and transformation. In this verse, the Apostle Paul states that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is being a new creation. Arachia and Nita explore the significance of this statement, maintaining its departure from traditional Jewish customs towards a more inclusive and spiritually focused Christian ethos. The commentary points out that physical circumcision, a significant Jewish ritual symbolizing the covenant with God, is rendered irrelevant in the Christian context. This irrelevance is not just a dismissal of a ritual, but signifies a fundamental shift in understanding one's relationship with God. In Christianity, as interpreted by Paul, the focus is on spiritual rebirth and transformation, symbolized by the term new creature or new creation. This new creation is not about physical or ethnic identity, being Jewish, circumcised, or Gentile, uncircumcised, but about a profound inner change. Arakia and Nita explore the translation nuances of the term new creature. The alternate translation as new creation reiterates the active role of God in this transformation. This linguistic analysis repeats the theological message. What matters is not one's physical identity or adherence to rituals, but the transformative act of God in an individual's life. Moreover, their interpretation addresses the challenge of translating these concepts across languages and cultures. They suggest alternative translations that capture the essence of the verse, such as, being a new kind of person is what matters, 
or being created anew by God. This flexibility in translation ensures that the core message of spiritual transformation and rebirth transcends cultural and linguistic barriers, making the verse's profound truth accessible to diverse audiences. In summary, Erechia and Nita's interpretation of Galatians 6.15 underlines the Christian doctrine of spiritual transformation over physical or ritualistic identity markers. It underscores a shift from ethnic or ritual purity to a universal spiritual rebirth, central to Christian identity and relationship with God. Furthermore, verse 16 serves as a benediction specifically directed at those who abide by the principles Paul has outlined in the preceding verses. The word rule in this context, originally meaning a physical measuring tool like a cane or reed, is metaphorically used by Paul to represent a guiding principle or standard. This interpretation has evolved over time, with the term later acquiring the connotation of a rule of faith or canon, a development that occurred well after Paul's era. The Greek term for follow in this passage is open to various translations, such as walk, live by, or take this principle for their guide. These different renderings emphasize the notion of living a life in alignment with the teachings Paul advocates. Paul incorporates two pivotal theological concepts in this blessing, peace and mercy. Peace is likely indicative of eschatological salvation, a future, ultimate state of salvation. Mercy is interpreted as God's benevolence or kindness. This benediction is framed as a prayer, with Paul expressing a desire for God to bestow these virtues upon his followers. The phrase, all of God's people, translates literally to the Israel of God in the original text, leading to varying interpretations. Some understand it as a reference to a faithful subset within Israel, while the predominant interpretation views it as denoting the Christian church. In this latter view, Paul sees the church as the new Israel, connected to God through faith rather than lineage. This interpretation is bolstered by translations that clearly align the Israel of God with the Christian community. In addition, Arachaea and Nita probe into the profound symbolism and authority in Paul's closing words to the Galatians. This verse forms the culmination of his message, blending a definitive assertion of his leadership with a stark reminder of his sacrifices for Christ. Paul's statement, Let no man trouble me, is not merely a request for peace, but a firm command. He seeks to accentuate his authority and put an end to any further challenges or disputes from the Galatians. This command reflects his desire for unobstructed continuation of his mission and teachings without further hindrance or opposition. The central element of this verse is the reference to the marks of Jesus on his body. Arachia and Nita explain that this metaphor is likely a reference to the ancient practice of branding slaves with the marks of their masters. In Paul's context, these marks are not just symbolic, but are actual physical scars and wounds he has suffered in his journey of faithfulness and obedience to Jesus Christ. These scars serve as a testament to his devotion and his identity as a servant of Christ. Arachia and Nita affirm the importance of accurate and culturally sensitive translation of this verse. The phrase, let no one give me any more trouble, should be interpreted as a directive, an authoritative command from Paul, rather than a mere suggestion or plea. This can be translated variably in different languages to convey the authoritative tone such as, no one must give me any more trouble, or in a more explicit commanding form. Further, the description of Paul's scars may need adaptation in different linguistic contexts. It can be translated as, the scars on my skin, the results of the wounds I have had, or my healed wounds, depending on what resonates best in a particular culture or language. In summary, Galatians 6.17 stands as a powerful testament to Paul's unwavering commitment to his faith and his authority as a servant of Christ. His direct command to the Galatians and the physical evidence of his sacrifices assert his dedication and the legitimacy of his apostleship. Last but not least, they highlight the concise nature of the blessing, which is distinctively focused solely on Jesus Christ. This is a notable departure from Paul's usual style, where he typically includes references to the Father and the Holy Spirit. The commentators indicate that grace, a term used in this benediction, is part of a traditional formula and caution against attributing excessive theological interpretation to its use in this particular context. Their analysis then shifts to how Paul addresses the Galatian community. Rather than a direct salutation, Paul refers to their spirit a technique Arachia and Nita find particularly apartment. The reason for this appropriateness lies in the letter's emphasis on the Spirit, especially in its concluding chapters. They interpret this final benediction as a form of prayer, noting that in various linguistic and cultural contexts, it might require an explicit framing as a prayer. 
The term grace in this prayer, they suggest, is often translated in different languages as an expression of unmerited kindness or mercy. Besides, Arachia and Nita remark on Paul's enduring affection and faith in the Galatians, as evidenced by his consistent reference to them as brothers. Despite his earlier misgivings and admonishments throughout the letter, his final words reaffirm his commitment and hope for their spiritual growth and overcoming of challenges. Lastly, their commentary touches on the use of Amen at the end of the prayer. They note its widespread usage and transliteration in Christian traditions. However, they also acknowledge the potential need for translation in different languages, where Amen might be expressed as an affirmation of agreement or a wish for the prayer to be realized, like, Indeed, let it be so, or That is just what should be. This suggests a flexibility in translating this term to resonate with the linguistic and cultural nuances of various audiences. In conclusion, Erechia and Nita provides a nuanced interpretation of the Apostle Paul's writing style and its theological implications. They propose that Paul likely used a scribe for most of his letter to the Galatians, personally writing only specific sections, a hypothesis supported by his use of distinctly large letters in this passage. This change in handwriting style is thought to maintain important points or to authenticate the letter, ensuring its recognition as genuinely Pauline. Additionally, Erechia and Nita focus on Paul's vehement criticism of false teachers within the early Christian community, particularly concerning circumcision. They dissect Paul's language to point out the contrast between the teacher's desire for social approval through external religious rites and the core Christian principle of faith over outward rituals. This discussion extends to Paul's assertion that physical attributes like circumcision are irrelevant in Christian identity. What counts is being a new creation. This term symbolizes a shift from ethnic or ritualistic identity to spiritual rebirth and transformation. Also, the authors examine different scholarly perspectives on the identity of the group practicing circumcision and the ambiguity in translations. Paul's critique, as they interpret, targets those who value external religious practices over the essence of Christian faith, a theme that recurs throughout his letters. Moreover, Arachia and Nita delve into the use of the term boast in Paul's writings. They note the contrasting usage in Galatians 6.13 and 6.14, where it carries both pejorative and positive connotations, respectively. Paul's emphasis on the cross as his sole ground for boasting signifies a shift in values from external measures to divine acceptance through faith. Lastly, they interpret Paul's closing words as a powerful testament to his dedication and authority as a servant of Christ. The reference to the marks of Jesus on his body reiterates his sacrifices and commitment to his faith, with recommendations for translation that reflect the authoritative and symbolic nature of his statement. Overall, Arachia and Nita's interpretation repeats the significance of translation choices in accurately conveying biblical nuances, underlining the transformative power of the crucifixion and the Christian doctrine of spiritual transformation.